is what gives substance to what you desired, what you prayed for, and of course, uh, it's based on the authority of the Word. This Word is no less powerful than if Jesus came back to minister as He ministered on planet Earth. And you notice in His own hometown, He could there do no mighty works because of their unbelief. He tried to, at one translation, said he tried to, but he couldn't. Now, that was the Son of God, anointed with the Holy Ghost and healing power. But you see, when people didn't exercise faith, it didn't draw the anointing out of him. So faith gives substance to it, what the promise says and, and what the Scripture says. Now, uh, Paul said... <clears throat> The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood, the things that are made. God made the heaven and the earth, and the earth is designed to produce what you plant in it. You plant a seed, and you reap a harvest. Now, in the parable of the sower, Jesus said, the sower sows the word. Where does he sow it? He talked about sowing it in the hearts of man. So the heart is likened to soil. It will produce anything you plant in it. So when we speak God's Word, we're planting the seed. You remember in the 17th chapter of Luke, Jesus said he had faith as a mustard seed. You would say to the mulberry tree, be plucked up by the root, be planted in the sea, and it should obey you, or it would obey you, the Greek says. Inanimate objects would obey you. He proved a fig tree would obey him. Now, you, you find people uh, sometimes that are talking, you know, because they're just talking about what happens to them in life, you know. Well, I always run out of money before the end of the month. Money just seems to get away from me. I just can't hold on to money. It just disappears. It just... Now, that money's made out of the tree, and it's been obeying you. Faith gives substance to things. Fear, the opposite end of that truth is fear gives substance to things you don't desire. If faith gives substance to things you do desire, fear is the opposite force of faith. It gives substance to things you don't desire. Job proved that. He said, the thing I've greatly feared has come upon me. The thing I was afraid of is coming to me. So he was highly developed in his fear. Ecclesiastes 10th chapter says, He that breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Well, that's what happened. You read the first chapter of Job. He was highly developed in his fear. You get over to the third chapter, he said, The thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And then he said, Teach me and I'll hold my tongue. Now he found out his tongue had something to do with it. Because that's the way you plant the seed. If you had faith as a seed, you would say, so what he was highly developed in was fear that his kids were going to get killed in a storm and that his cattle were all going to get killed by lightning. You know, the Scripture says fire came from heaven and killed his cattle. Well, they're all probably in a, in a pond. I was flying over some, some uh, cattle country in Arkansas and one hot summer day, and they must have been 45 or 50 head of cattle in this pond. And if a lightning bolt hit that pawn, it would kill every one of them. And that's probably what happened. But the thing you fear, you gravitate toward it. The thing you believe is giving substance to the things the Word says, if it's based on the authority of the Word. Now, Paul said, the invisible things of God from the creation world are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made. The law of Genesis says that the fruit tree whose seed is in itself. That's where the seed is. It's in, the, in that fruit itself. And if you're smart enough to plant the seed, the DNA of God is in the Word of God. The genetic makeup of that seed will produce after its kind. Now, you get over into uh, Leviticus, the 19th chapter, and it says, don't plant mingled seed in your, in your, on your land. Mingled seed. What is a mingled seed? It's what we'd call a hybrid today. Why? Because a hybrid seed will not produce after its kind. It's cross-pollinated with some other 
plant, it may make it look bigger, may have a bigger fruit, but there's no more nutrients in it than there was in the small one. And the scripture says, uh, don't plant uh, mingled seed. Why? Because it won't produce after its kind. You can take the, the seed from a hybrid plant and plant it the next year, it reverts back to the old seed. It won't, it won't be hybrid next year. Now, if you genetically change the seed, and they found ways to do that, they genetically change cotton and so soybeans some way. I don't know how they do it, but they've engineered a genetic change in the plant to where you can spray Roundup herbicide over cotton, and it won't hurt it. And you can spray it over the Roundup soybeans because they've been genetically altered, and it'll kill the grass, but it won't kill the soybeans. What a blessing. <laughs> I, we didn't have that when I was farming. And, and you had to pull those weeds out by hand. But, but this is the point, that God created the earth to produce after its kind. God's Word always produces after its kind. Now, he said the invisible things are clearly seen, being understood the things that are made. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed a copy machine? You can take a copy machine and, and put this Bible on it, or New Testament, and uh, punch that button. That light, bright light comes on there. And you notice you don't have to proofread the copy. <laughs> Why don't you? You let somebody type it, you better proofread the copy. I had a lady work with me one time, and, and, she, and sometimes I didn't read the letters after I dictated them, you know. I'd, I'd just, she'd put them on my desk, and I'd just sign them. And, and the Lord said to me one day, said, you better read this letter. <laughs> so so I, I started reading it, and I, I said something about the sower, and she had sewer. Just a little slip up there, but it's a, a lot of difference, you know. And, uh, but anyway, you don't have to worry about proofreading the copy. Why? It's an exact duplication of kind. Somebody said, now, Brother Caps, how do you know the law of faith will work? You don't have to proofread the copy. You just learn how to operate in that law. And Jesus tells us how the law of faith works. Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, believe what he is saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And believe that those things, now that's, that's one of the things that I didn't catch for a long time. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I got all this in that scripture there, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. He said, no, read it again. And, and I read it several times, then I, it seemed like the words, those things which he saith, just jumped out at me. And I said, well, I never saw that. <laughs> In other words, not just what you said to the mountain or the situation, the circumstance you're trying to change, you release faith in every word you say. Now, this is why it's so important to not speak things you don't believe. You hear people talking about, tickle me to death, laugh the thought of die, die and to go, gonna die if I don't. All kinds of things. Well, you know, the Bible says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. Nobody in here taking medicine to die, is there? You got a prescription filled and you looked at red on the label. You got home and said, take three of these a day till they kill you. What would you do with them? <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing away. You'd be smarter than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, if you believe and doubt not in your heart, it doesn't happen just because you said it, but saying it is involved in setting the spiritual law in motion. And there are some things that uh, if you say it long enough, you set spiritual law in motion, and, and there is a point of no return somewhere where it's going to come past. If you remember, Elvis Presley said, I'll never live any longer than my mother. And he didn't. He set spiritual law in motion. They still, doctors still don't know what killed him. He had some drugs in his body, but not enough to kill him. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Abraham Lincoln said, when this war is over, I shall die. 
Wouldn't it have been good if he said, when this war is over, I'll live to be an old man and see this nation rise to be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. If he'd have said that over and over instead of saying, when this war is over, I'll die, he'd have felt led to stay home and read his Bible that night instead of going to the Ford Theater where he was assassinated. Spiritual forces. We gravitate toward what we speak and believe. And this is why it's so important to let God's Word flow out of us because when you speak it out, it gets on the inside here. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Remember the Apostle Paul said, the Word is nigh thee. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we preach. He's talking about the Word of promise. You speak it and you hear it. We have two sets of ears, the outer ear, the inner ear. Now Paul said the outward man perish, but the inward man is renewed day by day. Well, what's the outer ears for the outer man, the inner ears for the inner man. If you plug your ears up and talk, it's louder to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart, is what Paul said. So if you if you want if there is ever a shortcut to faith, that's it. You speak God's word after him. You speak it and you will believe more quickly what you say than what anyone else says. So it's a way to, to program the human spirit in confessing the word. First of all, it's probably doing very little to change your circumstance. First of all, it's changing you and the way you think. It renews your mind to the Word of God. When you confess there is abundance and no lack, when you're looking at lack, see the natural world and the natural mind would say, well, you're just lying. But you see, in the realm of the Spirit, things work the opposite for they do in the natural world. That's why Paul said the carnal mind's enmity against God, not subject to the law of God. You've got to get your mind renewed to get a hold of this message from God's Word because he's operating in spiritual law. Now, you, you, you hear people say it all the time. Well, you just have to say it like it is. If you say anything else, you're just lying. Well, you better be careful because you may be calling Jesus a liar and God also. Because like I said, you don't get the three verses into Genesis. You see God calling things that are not. He saw darkness and said light. Somebody said, well, I don't understand that because you see that's God. We'll read a little further. Maybe you can understand this. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Let them have dominion. You're capable of operating in the same spiritual principle that God operated in. In fact, according to the Word of God, what Jesus said, you're capable of operating on the same level of faith with God when you're born again. Now you have to develop faith in the Word. You understand that? Because when you get born again, you don't know everything. You don't know all the scriptures to base it on. But here's what Jesus said. All things are possible to him that believeth. Well, another scripture says all things are possible with God. Then Jesus said all things are possible to him that believeth. Then Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also in greater works than these shall you do. He said, you're capable of doing greater works. Now, you might struggle with that till you realize that Jesus was limited in what he could do here on planet Earth because when he was living here, the earth lease had not expired. And when Jesus arose from the dead and had his glorified body, you notice he never healed another single person, never cast out one demon, never did a single miracle after he rose from the dead. Why? He was limited because he was restored to his divine Godhead power. He was as much God as God was God, and God had given man dominion over this planet. As long as he had the physical flesh, blood, and bone body, he had authority to destroy the works of the devil. But you notice he didn't destroy the works of the devil until he was baptized in the River Jordan, and the uh, Holy Ghost came upon him and anointed him. He went into the synagogue and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Now, if he was operating as God, as most people believe he was when he was here on the earth, why didn't he do those miracles before he was 30 years age and before he was baptized in the River Jordan? 
He had the authority to do it because he had the body of a man. He was a legal resident of this planet, so he had authority on this planet. But he didn't have the anointing to do it until God anointed him. And when he arose from the dead, he was restored to his divine Godhead powers as God. He was as much God as God is God. And then he stood on the mountain in the 28th chapter of Matthew. He said, all power is given to me both in heaven and earth. Now you go in my name. You cast out the demons. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In other words, he delegated the authority. See, Mark 16 records, uh, Mark records it. Uh, a little different than Matthew did. But, but he, he stood there and he said, all power is given me both in heaven and earth. Now you go in my name. Why? Because you have the body. A legal, physical body on this planet. It gives you authority here. Have you noticed that people, uh, uh, wh wh when they're dead, they don't vote anymore? <laughs> uh, the reason the devil wants your body sick, crippled, or dead, it'll severely inhibit your authority, especially if you're dead. Now, over in Texas, there's one graveyard voted, you know, but it's not legal. <laughs> but you see, the, the authority of the Word is the final authority. So, we're capable of operating on the same level of faith with God. Now, that doesn't mean we're developed to that. We're capable of doing it. If you can believe it, you can have it, or you can do it. It's based on the authority of the Word. That's why that faith gives substance to things. What things are we talking about? The things that God has given us. And He's given to us all things that pertain to life and Godliness. Now, I, get back to that copy machine. <laughs> that copy machine, the way some copy machines work, especially if you've got a, a copy paper, that copy paper it has an electrical charge on it. Now, you can't see it. You don't know it's on there, but it is. And uh, when you uh, put this Bible or any printed material on there, punch that button, the light, that intense light, will eliminate the charge off of that paper. Now, the whole sheet of paper, the whole roll of paper is charged with a, I don't know whether it's positive or negative charge, but it, it the light, the intense light, will eliminate the charge except where the shadow of this print is. And it leaves the charge where the print is. Now you have the carbon that has the opposite charge. One of them is positively charged, the other is negatively charged, and they attract. So, if you could pull that paper out of that copy machine before it went under the carbon, you'd say, well, there's nothing on this, but there is. It's polarized. And when it goes under that carbon, because the carbon has the, the positive charge, let's say, then it, it'll only place it'll stick is where the shadow was. It won't stick on the other. I mean, you can smear it on there, it won't stick. It only sticks where it's polarized. Now, the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made. You get the Word of God in your spirit and polarize the human spirit with the promises of God. You can walk out in the midst of curses, and they'll run off of you like water off a duck's back, for the entrance of the Word bringeth light. And it eliminates that charge that will cause the other things to stick there, the, the curses to stick. It'll eliminate the curses. Amen. You can walk in the midst of curses, run off of you like water off a duck's back. But you get your spirit polarized with the Word of God, the blessings of God, and faith gives substance to them. You get within a mile of a blessing. It'll run you down from behind. It'll overtake you. Amen. We used to play with what we call lodestones. You know, you take that thing and you, you turn it a certain way and, and try to push it up to some paper clips. And it, you, you couldn't push it fast enough to touch a paper clip. It would push them all off the table. But you turn it the other way, and if you ever got it that far from it, it they'd all stick to it. <laughs> See, when you get yourself polarized with the Word of God, the blessings will stick. The curses will run from you. They'll flee from you as in terror. 
When you become fully persuaded, the Bible says that Abraham became fully persuaded. Abram never was fully persuaded, but Abraham became fully persuaded. What God had promised, he was able to perform. How did he do that? God changed his name, and he had to say what God said about him. Twenty-four years, the man had the promise of God, no manifestation of it. God couldn't, you can't find a scripture, at least I haven't been able to, where he ever said what God said about him. He kept asking God, what will you give me, seeing I go childish? God had told him, I'm going to give you everything you can see. If you can see it, you can have it. God will still give you everything you can see in these promises if you can get it on the inside of you and you take your words and speak uh, your voice and speak God's word until you get the blueprint in here of it. That's you follow. The, you'll be led by your spirit to follow that blueprint. You'll be in the right place at the right time for the manifestation of the promise of God to come fast because the entrance of God's word brings light to you. And what did Proverbs say? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, the light bulb that God uses to enlighten you. It not only enlighten you, it'll eliminate the curses. Now, let, let's talk about the Polaroid camera. Somebody made that Polaroid camera, and Paul said the invisible things of God in the creation world clearly seen being understood by things that are made. So somebody made the camera. How does it work? But the polarization of light. That film is so sensitive, in fact, you know, any camera today is that way, uh, especially the uh, movie cameras and cameras that you instant and uh, digital cameras and some of your phones, you know, you can clip thing and, and then there it is, right there, you know. You don't have to have the film developed. It just happens that, that quick. It captures that image. Now, when you speak God's Word, you begin to capture the image because words create images. Now, have you ever noticed that when you punch that, that Polaroid camera, of course, we haven't used them in years. I guess they still have them. I don't know. But, but you'd, you'd punch that button, it'd go zzzz, and that little film would come out. You could pull it out and look at it. Why, there's nothing on that, but there is. You just can't see it. You just wait a minute, and it'll develop right before your eyes because it's already been exposed. You tend to gravitate to what you've got on the inside of you. You're led by your spirit because the, the, the human spirit is the light bulb that God uses to enlighten you. You ever had the Lord to say something to you? You know, do this before you do that. A lady said to me one time, said, the Lord told me to send your ministry $10. I said, Lord, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that, but, but I'm going to the grocery store first. And the Lord said again, I'll do it now. Uh, well, you know, I don't see any reason to do that. See, we go to reasoning. Carnal mind's enmity against God, not subject to the law of God. Now, see, so she walks to the, didn't have a car. She walked nearly a mile to the grocery store. She got her groceries and started to write out the check and found out she was out of checks. She had written the last one the last time she went. And that's what God's trying to get over to her. Write the check now. You'll find out you don't have one, and you won't have to walk back home and get the check and come back. She had to walk four miles instead of two miles. <laughs> the manifestation of the Spirit of God is profitable to everyone with all. <laughs> you've had the Spirit of God say things to you, and you've said, well, I don't understand why I have to do that. He's trying to enlighten you. It may not be what you think, like her. Oh, I don't see why I have to do it now, because I'm going to do it when I get back. But it would have saved her a lot of time and trouble. I'm excited about our CD offer today. It's a CD offer, 1124. It's for $8 plus $3 postage and handling. It's entitled, Making a Demand on God's Provision for Healing. Now, sometimes people say, what do you mean making a demand on God's provision or making a demand on God? We're not talking about demanding of God to do something that he hadn't already done. We're talking about making a demand on what God has already made provision for. And Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. His chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes ye were healed. We are healed, it says. We are healed. That's past tense, isn't it? 
Now, this is something that God has made provision for. And when we understand that, you realize God doesn't have to do another single thing. Jesus does not have to suffer one more stripe. First Peter 2.24 tells us, Who his own self bear our sins and his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Notice past tense again. So it's already a settled fact that healing belongs to us, but we have to call for it. We have to make a demand on God's provision, just much like you make a demand on your bank account. If you never make a demand on your bank account, you could live and die and never benefit from it. You have to write a demand note, a check, and you make a demand on the provision. We're not demanding of God to do something. We're demanding of the provision that he's already made for us. Psalms 107 verse 20 says, God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Notice, he didn't send his word to do it. He sent his word and did it. It's a finished work at Calvary. Jesus already paid the price. Jesus has already brought the healing. We have to make a demand on the provision. And as I said, it's much like making a demand on your bank account. But you must be fully persuaded of what the promise says that it belongs to you that it is yours. It is a finished work at Calvary. He doesn't have to suffer one more stripe. So we, most people are trying to talk God into healing them when he's already done it. This series will help you. It's called Making a Demand on God's Provision for Healing, CD offer number 1124 for $8 plus $3 postage and handling. Toll-free order line is 1-877-396-9400. Until next time, this is Charles Capps reminding you the enemy is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? We are glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. To order the product offered on today's program, send your check or money order to Charles Capps Ministries. Or to place your order on Visa or MasterCard, call 1-877-396-9400. For more information about Charles Capps Ministries or for a schedule of meetings, write to Charles Capps Ministries, P.O. Box 69, England, Arkansas, 72046. This broadcast has been sponsored by Charles Capps Ministries, and our partners in this area.